Welcome to Real Vision. This is a conversation I've been looking forward to for such a long time. Uh, we have here with us Nick Kokonis of Alinea Group and Talk. And Nick, I'm actually going to start with my hardest question first. And that is, if you're at a dinner party and a stranger has the gall to ask you an impudent question of what do you do for a living, how in the world do you answer that? I, I actually have an answer for this. I say I'm a writer. And then they say, what do you write? I say about 200 emails a day. Um, which is kind of what we all do at this point. I always actually answer that I'm a trader. Um, even though I own restaurants and a software company now, I still have the mindset and still consider myself to be an options trader. Um, and I, 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 I don't know, maybe that's wrong at this point because I certainly don't do much of it, but I still, I kind of filter everything through that still. It's a good example because like trader, entrepreneur, a lot of similarities. And I think that's going to be a through line of our conversation today is like, there's a lot of uh, paradoxes to traders and entrepreneurs. You know, you're either, everybody thinks you're a risk taker, but you're actually trying to mitigate risk as much as possible. You're risk averse. You know, you're preternaturally, you know, optimistic. But at the same time, I think we walk around kind of angry or just annoyed all the time. And that's when we want to fix things. And it just bothers us for years at a time. And then eventually we figure out how to fix it. But part of that is we're just arbitrageurs or options takers, right? And it's, you know, that I think that we'll, we'll touch on the different points of that, but like, I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts on that in general, but like, I think that entrepreneurship is a bug, not a feature. Walking around angry is an interesting way of phrasing it um, or annoyed, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty accurate. You know, I, um, I, I feel like I'm always, if I sit down in a cafe and this has been true since I was a little kid, I immediately start looking at like, well, what's the throughput here? How many people do you think they get a day? And I just do math. Like, and it's not hard math, like all business is kind of back of the envelope. And so uh, I, I just have always done that ever since I saw lemonade stand on an Apple II, like, you know, that that game, I kind of try to lemonade stand everything and, uh, you know, the tools get more sophisticated, but at the end of the day, it's all, it's all kind of the same. I think about it as um, people always ask, like, how do you come up with good entrepreneurial ideas or good business ideas? I'm like, what are you talking about? I have 10 business ideas a day it's filtering all the bad ones. And then the ones that stick with you for years that you can't get out of your head, eventually you're like, well, nobody else is going to do it. I have to do it myself. That's exactly right. That's how Alinea started. I was terrified to build Alinea. That's how Talk started. I was terrified to build Talk, but then I kept waiting for someone else to do it and it wasn't happening. And so you, you started with, I'm a writer. And so let's go back. You know, you studied philosophy at Colgate. And I think you got extremely lucky in that you had a professor that taught you brevity in philosophy where you could have easily gone down like Wittgensteinian obfuscation route. Ah, so I, was actually, I was actually a Wittgensteinian. Uh, that's what I studied. Um, uh, you know, early Wittgenstein, Yeah, very different than late. So exactly. early Wittgenstein was all symbolic um, logic. And, and um, I, uh, yes, I got exceptionally lucky to have Jerry Belmuth um, at Colgate, who was, I think at one point, the longest running tenured professor in America, um, was there from the time he was about 24 years old till he passed away at 94. And he took me under his wing and, and taught me how to think and how to write and forced me to do well. Um, when I say forced, I mean that very literally, he was he was pretty intimidating. Um, I don't know that he would survive very long on a campus in 2021. Um, he was pretty pretty harsh with with folks. He didn't suffer fools, and he he drove me really hard for four years. And I feel very lucky that he did. And coming out of Colgate, you know, you you come out into the real world and you have to get a job, right? And you're like, what am I trained for? You know, I understand philosophy. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important, is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you one dollar. I don't think you can afford to be without it. Years, and I feel very lucky that he did. And coming out of Colgate, you know, you, you come out into the real world, and you have to get a job, right? And you're like, "What am I trained for?" You know, I understand philosophy, I understand logic, I understand how to write. Um, but what doesn't get talked about a lot these days is in the '90s, you and I had to deal with 
entrepreneurship was not cool then. If you were an entrepreneur, everybody looked down at you as a pejorative word. And so you come out of college and you start getting jobs, but you start working these nine to five jobs and it just is a nightmare. But like, I, I want to talk about, you know, how did you feel then? Did you feel like I'm a complete loser? I don't know how to do anything. And this is going to be the rest of my life. I'm stuck here. Like, how did you struggle through that? You know, it's interesting. My, my dad, um, my dad's dad died when he was a kid. And he kind of worked jobs from the time he was 13 just to help his family make ends meet. So he used to say that he was an entrepreneur by necessity because no one would hire him. So he got out of, he served in both the Navy and the Army. He was drafted twice, which is crazy, into World War II and the beginning of the Korean War. So he was just young enough to get into World War II and just old enough to get into the Korean War. And afterwards, he, he worked at the Green Grocer that he worked at and he bought it that he worked at from the time he was 13. So when he was 28, he, he bought that. So I worked. I grew up with a dad who who just always did his own thing because he kind of had to figure it out. Um, and when I graduated from Colgate, I, I had good enough grades where I would I would apply to like the investment banking jobs and whatnot, and I would do well on the math test and the logic test, and I you know I tested well, and then the psych test, and I would get a job offer, and I think I was one of the only people who read the contract, which basically said we can do anything we want with you. Um, for the next three years. And I would negotiate it and they would say, no, 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 you don't understand. This is like a job at Goldman Sachs or Societe Generale or whatever it was. And I would kind of go like, I don't know that I want to do this. You know, my dad's got a pretty good gig. He always showed up at my basketball games as a kid. All the other dads were flying around and, and, you know, working really hard and, and, you know, 60 hours a week. And my dad certainly worked hard, but he also had the freedom that, you know, something with the family was going on, he, he could be there for us. So that was a lure to me. Um, it was, it, it was like, everything else felt like false prestige. You know what I mean? Like, is it really that prestigious to work at Goldman Sachs? Do I really want to do that? And I had gotten into law school and, and I had, had basically spent a day in law school. And um, I just kind of went, ah, I just don't know that I want to be a lawyer. Like, I find it interesting. I wrote my senior thesis on international law and, and philosophy. And yet I, I, people told me, oh, you'd make a great lawyer, but I didn't really want to be a lawyer. So I floundered after I got out of school, mostly because I didn't want to take a job at a big corporation and I didn't want to go to law school. And if you think about it, and this is still true, the metrics of higher education still have like career office and the top 50 rankings are by how much do you make six years out of school and how many people have a job afterwards and, and all that sort of stuff. And one of the failures of the career offices is that they don't let you know that, Hey, you can become a design professional or a photographer or any of these things. And, you know, now they have studies in entrepreneurship, I'm not so sure you can really study that, to be honest with you. Um, Colgate actually this year, like a couple of weeks ago, um, just called me and said, hey, we're naming you the entrepreneur of the year. And I was like, that's a thing now. Like, you know? So it's an interesting problem. But some of the best entrepreneurs I know and the best traders I know actually studied philosophy, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah, I think about what did Taleb say that the three most addictive things are heroin, simple carbohydrates, and a steady paycheck. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, right. I think that, and I think it was Ryan Holiday said, and it's I think it's an old trope that you know how do you spell freedom? You spell it autonomy, right? And that's and that's why I wonder, you know, with all due respect to like our mutual acquaintance Tim Ferriss, is like I don't think you can train people to be entrepreneurs. You're either born that way. You just can't. You can't handle being under under somebody else's umbrella. You're you're not impressed by you know I a job title or a salary, you're impressed by doing your own thing. And you just can't yeah, help, you can't listen to anybody else. I think the ultimate like freedom is self-reliance, right? So for me, I always wanted to own my own situation. I just didn't want to like end up at, at a job or a, or a place where I went like, oh gosh, I, I have no control over this situation, whether it succeeds or fails, I can't have enough input. You know, what's interesting now is that having started some businesses, I have very, very key employees that are themselves entrepreneurs, even though they work for me because they joined when it was five people, you know, and that's very different than joining a big company. 
Yeah, they're very much like entrepreneurs. And we'll get to that later because I think it's fascinating to then run a business with so many employees and then you're somebody that's unemployable. It's like, how do you make the connection with them? So we'll, we'll, we'll tease that out through the story. But I think let's, let's go back again a little bit. So you come out of college and everything. Tell me about uh, dorm room posters. Yeah, I mean, like, look, I, I didn't know what to do. And I was kind of like just, you know, floundering around. I worked at the attorney general's office, you know, here in Chicago, which was kind of brain numbing. And that's, I thought I was going to go back to law school. So I, I should do that. And then I thought like, well, what market do I know? I know college students. And so I was, you know, just out of college and going, well, what does every college student buy? And I, I made a list. I literally wrote down a list of what every college student buys. And there are things like blue jeans and beer. And I was like, oh, those are really covered. And somehow I, I wrote down, you know, posters because they all have walls. You get in a new dorm room every, every cycle. And I just remember like one of the things that everyone did when they first moved in is that they grabbed a few posters and threw them on the walls and the guys would take anything. They would take Sports Illustrated or, or whatever, and just rip pages out. But the women kind of had this like aesthetic that they went for with their dorm rooms. Um, and I bet it's still true. I mean, I haven't been in a dorm room in a very long time, but um, you know, it was like the Monet Monet posters and Duano with the, with the kiss under the Eiffel Tower and all that. And I started just like looking at the bottom corner of those. And they all said either Bruce McGaugh graphics or Graphique de France. So this is pre-internet. You know, what I found out is that all of those museum posters were all made by two companies. Those two I just mentioned. And so I called them up, said I had a poster and framing shop, which I didn't. They sent me two catalogs and I was like, holy cow, you can buy these things for $5 and sell them for 30. Like, <laughs> Ding. So I just hired some um, reps at uh, campuses at first. Um, and uh, basically on move in day at sororities in the Big Ten, I had reps all over the place and they sold lots of posters. And for every 10 they sold, they got a free one for their sorority house. And it worked like too well. Like, you know, it wasn't like an ongoing concern because it was only on move in day. But I think the first day that I did it, we sold like $180,000 of posters, which at the time was roughly like what I would have made for a year working at Goldman Sachs. And my other favorite part of that story is like, that's the other thing that's not told about entrepreneurs is the insatiable curiosity, right? To figure out how is this made? Who makes this? Where does it come from? And keep asking those questions till you find an answer. And then you're looking at that arbitrage between five and 30. I love that you, you hired bird dogs to go out and sell these things, but we're also did you mitigate your risk through arbitrage by like you, did you pre-sell them or did you have a yeah, initial no, I order? I, I bought like, I got samples in, they sent me samples. Um, and then I bought like, you know, the top, the cool thing was they had statistics on what the top selling was by age bracket and all that. So they had demographic statistics. So I just was like, okay, I'm going to buy these 20, put them out as demos. And, you know, I just sold the same 20 posters to sorority houses all over the Midwest. And then why did you roll up or stop that business? Well, it was like good for like four days a year. <laughs> so like, you know, it's, it wasn't a career, you know what I mean? It was, it was like, you know, I, I had made some money then I had some, some money in the bank and I was like, okay, what do I do with this? So I started selling um, posters to um, like higher end lithographs and posters to uh, office spaces. So when you move into an office, they had kind of like, you know, nicer versions of the same thing. But I didn't really think of it as a career. Like it wasn't, it was like a way to make money. It was a way to learn how to set up a business. Like I learned how to set up an LLC again, pre-internet. So you couldn't just Google, how do I start an LLC and fill out the forms? Like, so I learned a lot about just like the very basic stuff of this is how you set up a business. This is how you pay the tax returns on it, all that sort of thing. Um, but it didn't feel like a career. And on top of that, I, I just, I still didn't know what I wanted to do. Like, I didn't see myself like building a poster empire. Like that was just something I happened upon. So, you know, I was just kind of floundering around my, my future father-in-law accused me of becoming an intellectual bum. He was like, you know, you got into like Ivy league law schools and you're, you're like selling posters to sororities, like gather yourself up young man. <laughs> That was a, a nice, uh, tough love by him because I think, you know, you could have easily gone the other way, right? You could have worked five days a week and then followed your other passion for golf 360 days and just... Yeah, just the it golf was never my, never my nature. Exactly. You know, thinking about 
you know, we were lucky enough to be surrounded by a lot of these blue collar entrepreneurs throughout, you know, the Midwest as we were growing up. And I think about a lot of times the difference between New York and Chicago in finance, right? And, you know, New York is a very white collar investment bank world. And Chicago, you know, is those pit traders, eat what you kill, very blue collar, even though it's high very finance and it's People trading. People not realize how blue collar being a pit trader is. Like I, I, I show some of my friends now and some of the, the younger folks that work for me videos of the Mercantile Exchange. It was a wild and woolly place and the world's biggest fraternity house for better and for worse. And holy cow, like I saw things there that make Wolf of Wall Street seem, seem tame by comparison. At the same time, owning your situation, there is nowhere that you own your situation from day one more than you do on a trading floor. You still don't, like a lot of my acquaintances that work the pit, you still don't talk with your hands as much though as they do. Well, I did it, I did it this morning when I said, I, I told, I, I forgot what I said, but I said something like 88, the number 88 came up and I looked at my wife and I was like, 88, like, you know, and she knows it because she's lived with me forever. So like, she was like, did you just, did you just arm me? <laughs> so like, this is 88 folks. <laughs> But speaking of like the eat what you kill of that, that trading floor, there's a lot of stories that would happen then too. Is like, you know, a, when a trader's up, all of a sudden they're buying Porsches with cash. They've got a, a huge house, you know, on the North shore. And then next year they're selling their house or mortgaging their business. Like, I mean, it was, a, it was a crazy way to live. I watched that cycle over and over again. I was telling, um, you know, a friend a couple of weeks ago that I remember watching when a guy was selling, you know, way out of the money calls, teenies, and he would just sell them all the time, just every week, every week, every week. And it's because I've been telling people to sell way out of the money GME and Tesla calls on Twitter, you know, and I'm like, yeah, you don't really want to make a career doing this. Like this is, but right now this is, you know, the, the, the exception to the rule. Um, so I've been doing that like for two years with Tesla and I'm like 70 for 70 on those sales. I mean, it's, they're just wildly overpriced. That said, like this guy would do it every week. And so you, you know, they called it on the floor, eat like a bird, shit like an elephant. So he would do that for two years and then he'd blow out. And somehow he always found another backer because he could go like, oh yeah, I made money 27 of 28 months. Um, but I remember, and it was a probably good that I saw this when I was probably six months, seven months as a trader, trading just one and two lots, really small, making a little bit of money every day and learning how to do it. Um, I watched this guy blow out like fully, like, you know, and he got there, you can see he looked pale. I was long gamma and having a great day, long volatility. And I was kind of learning that, oh my gosh, like your deltas blow up too. when when the, when the vol goes up and you know, all this stuff that you theoretically learned, you internalize in a crisis like that. And what I also saw was that this guy lost everything house, kids, college funds, everything. And he looked really pale. And it was almost like he was like, there's no point in covering this. Like he had to close everything out. You know, the clearing firm told him to close everything out, but he just like was there and people were kind of giving him condolences almost. It was like a funeral. And then he just threw up and walked off the floor. And I was like, yeah, don't, don't do that ever, <laughs> you know, like, like, even though you're tempted to do that and they expire worthless 99% of the time, like you just can't put yourself at that existential risk. So I was very fortunate to also have a mentor on the floor who, who knew trading very, very well. and was a brilliant guy. And further, like I watched people lose everything firsthand. Um, and, and it's not like a pleasurable thing, but it is definitely instructive. Take me back a little bit to your, you know, you just said in that scenario, you're, you know, long Vega, long Gamma, but take me back to like your inception at the Merck, you know, when you're searching around for a trading style, you know, what did you find? Like, was it options? You know, what were calculators then? Were you starting yeah. out in the pits? Yeah. What, when well, you what calculators? That is a, also a great question. Yeah. I, 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 um, I got down there and I didn't really know much about it. Right. Except that like, this is, this is an interesting place. I'm going to take a job as like a runner just to, just to be exposed to it. So I had offers to work at, at investment banks that had traders down there and go through their training programs. But I kind of wanted to like, just see what the place was about before I committed to a three-year contract on something like that. And so I, I started applying to 
the clearing firms that were retail clearing firms back in the day. So that if you wanted to make a trade as, as a, you know, uh, in currencies or whatever, you would get like a Lind Waldock account or whatever. And, you know, you could call and you'd get someone on the floor, a phone clerk, and you'd be like, buy one, you know, and they would hand signal it in. So I would apply to those jobs and they would say, no, 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 you're way too qualified. Like, you know, you, you, you graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Colgate, like you don't want the runner job. So I started basically faking my resume in the wrong direction to get a runner job, got a runner job at $5 an hour um, and got down there and literally just held a piece of paper to a broker. Um, Seemed like a really stupid decision at the time to a lot of people. And that was reinforced to me daily, but it was like exposure. And most of the time it was a thoughtless job. I didn't have to think at all. Someone would hand you a piece of paper. You would literally run the piece of paper to the, to the broker and hold it up until they grabbed out of your hand. And then you would go back. But I liked that weirdly because I got to look around me and learn. And so that was fine for three or four months. Then I, they moved me up quickly to a phone clerk, which means I could take the phone orders. So I learned all of like the nomenclature and the signals and all that stuff, which is table stakes of working down there anyway. And then I started getting a little panicked because I'm like, okay, now I'm at the dead end. Like there's nothing more I can learn doing this. I'm answering a phone all day, just writing out the tickets. I'm actually further removed from the pits because I've moved up to like $8 an hour. <laughs> And I started looking around for a mentor and um, there was a guy down there, Mickey Hoffman at the time who ran like a trading class just to learn the art, the hand signals and open outcry and all that. And so I started looking around um, and reapplying to the jobs that I thought were better. Like, okay, now I know who the players are down here. I'm going to apply here, apply there. And finally, I just met a guy named Frank Serino who was at the time in his early 30s. He was trading independently. He used to be at Chicago Research and Trading. He was a quant. He went to the University of Chicago. He felt very different than the other um, independent traders down there because he was a geek. He was a total nerd. Like he stuck out like a sore thumb. And I, I talked to him and I said, I want to work for you because you're a geek and a nerd and clearly very smart. You're very different than everyone else. And he said, oh, I just hired a clerk. I don't need you. And I was like, damn it. I finally found the right person and he doesn't need me. And I was like, I'll pay you to work for you. And he was just like, well, that's really weird. Why? And I explained to him what I just explained to you. And I said, you know, I've got some ideas on like, you know, the computing stuff and all of that. And at the time, like you asked what the calculators were, the calculators were like calculators, like, you know, people are printing out off of the dot matrix printers upstairs option sheets for the day you couldn't really rerun them very quickly you couldn't figure out your greeks very quickly it wasn't nowhere near real time and he had like a little hewlett packard like programmable macro thing and i was like you know like what about the currency spreads like we could put currency spreads in there no one wants to make those so he he hired me at like 240 dollars a week you know um, and my goal when I got down on the floor as a clerk is I said, you know, runner, I said, I'm going to give it one year to the day and I'm going to be a trader. And six months in, that seemed very unrealistic. And when I got the job with him, one of the things that people don't understand, you know, they see the highlights of the craziness down there. But a lot of times you just stand there and do nothing all day. So while we were standing down there doing nothing all day, he taught me options theory, like graduate level like he was a math guy and a, and a quant for CRT. And so I got the full on like homework every night. Here's, here's what options are. Here's, here's how the skew changes, all these things. And I just, you know, I was young and I soaked it in and I was hungry. And, and a year the day later, I, I, I had a badge and I literally a year the day later, one day off. Um, and had a badge and, and a $60,000 account, which was nothing. I mean, that's nothing. And basically said, like, I'm going to make a trade my first day. Just make a trade. Like the rule after I taught people, um, you know, and started my own company was you have to make a trade on your first day. It's paralyzing to go down there and open your mouth. It's so hard. It's still one of the hardest. I'm like sweating talking about it. <laughs> 
it's one of the hard, I really am. It's one of the most stressful things I've ever done in my life is to walk down on that floor. You think everyone's looking at you because you've got the, the jacket and the badge. Now you have a license to lose your money basically. And you are chum. <laughs> like you are chum. I'm curious because your attention to detail, what color was your vest? Well, at the time it was a uh, sort of like a red, white and bluey thing. And uh, I still have, I should go up and run upstairs. I kept in my closet, and this is a long time ago. The day I walked off the trading floor, I hung it up in my closet and it is like sitting in my closet, never to be used again, but literally with every card, every phone number in it, everything, because it was iconic. Like it, to me, it felt like the thing that made me as a person. Because your attention to detail, that's why I asked what color was your vest. Because I'm sure out of your insatiable curiosity that we you're highlighting is that, you know, a lot of those pit traders were like six foot four former football players because they could get more attention. So how did like you draw attention to yourself? Like what was your what were your angles to make sure? I'm sure you're assessing all the angles in the pit. I could be, I was like a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, when I first got down there, I felt like the only thing I could do would be to portray myself as smarter than everyone. It's an arrogant thing to say, but like, um, I like day one, this one guy was making fun of me. They started calling me hanger bitch because, because I was so skinny at the time that like my coat looked like it was sitting on a hanger. <laughs> this is the kind of place it was. I got down there and what I didn't realize at the time, there was this other guy who started the very same day as me. He was an affable, chubby, like cherub-faced young kid. And as soon as he got down there, everyone wanted to trade with him. Like his first day, they're like, oh, it's your first day. Here's a five lot. Break the ice and all that. And I'm standing there and no one's talking to me. And then they're swearing at me and they're bumping me and they're poking me with their pens on purpose and all that. And I remember one of the guys said to me, he goes, he goes you'll be out of here in six months. And I said, you'll be asking me for a job in two years. And like, that was my attitude. Now, every night I went home and was like drained and ready to cry. But on the floor, I got there first guy in the morning. Like if someone arrived from my pit, they saw me and I would not go home. I wouldn't leave. Even if I was just doing a crossword puzzle up at the desk, I wanted them to see me there, the last guy there every day. And I did that for years. Um, and during lunch, they'd all go to the Merc Club for lunch, have a martini and a sandwich and all that. And I'd go like, cool, I got the pit to myself. So I would have like, an es I'd sneak in an espresso, I'd shoot an espresso, and I wouldn't use the bathroom for eight hours. And so I just grinded it out, you know, and and it worked, you know, it's like, it's like eventually, um, I can tell you the exact moment it worked. There was a, uh, there was like a, um, a very chaotic market and uh, on the close, there were some deep in the money calls, which are essentially one-to-one, -one, you know, hundred Delta calls. And they had like 57 of them to sell. And like, no one would make a market in them because the future market was gonna, was about to close. It was like three seconds left. And the broker was screaming, I need to get these off to market on close order. Someone make me a market. And I, I made the market knowing that I would have to run, get on the phones and get the over-the-counter aftermarket and that I'd probably lose on it. You know, I mean, it was like a, it was a coin flip, you know, it was not a great reason to do it, but I did all 57 of them, which was way more than I would normally do. And the broker was very thankful. I happened to get lucky on it. Um, and it kind of moved my, my way after the close, you know, we're talking about 30 seconds, but you know, and I made $7,000 on the trade. And the broker the next morning, like all the opening trades, the market on open, I was, you know, going 24, eight, and he'd be like, Nick, sell you 10, you one, one, one. And it was like, it just changed on a dime because I stepped up when I, when I had to. And it was, it was really a cool thing. Part of that though, is like, I'm curious how you think about this is you learned all the intuitive math with options, right? And you you practice and practice and practiced until you got such a good finger feel for it that somehow you had built up that compendium of knowledge that your subconscious had that gut feel to pull the trigger on those 57 contracts because somehow you knew you could get it off, right? Yeah, it was more like I, I, like, look, I was by far probably the worst guy at that in the pit at the time. I mean, there are some guys who had been there for 14 years and they, I mean, there was this one guy who I, I just loved. His name was Pete Fry, P 
Pete, if you ever see this, like you're awesome. And, and he, he, he had like a running mo a monologue of, of like stand up comedy going all day. And then they would call out any, any option in Swiss Frank options, anything. And somehow magically the guy would just spit it out instantly faster than anybody else. And I was sitting there going like, there's no way that he can have memorized this. Like, I don't understand how he, I still don't understand how he did it. He was, he was like rain man, but like not autistic, you know, he was just like this really charming, wonderful person. Um, these guys were amazing. There's just so many characters down there. I hope they make a good movie about it someday. You know? I, I really wish so too. I think there hasn't been a good movie about that. There hasn't been good movies about like the commodity corporation and all the people that came out of there. I think about these things all the time. Maybe if, every, maybe if we have any free time, we'll collaborate on a movie about it. Yeah, but yeah, because yeah. it's it's you can't imagine the the characters down there. Um, and and you know, I think that the bad characters get portrayed, but there are so many good, interesting people too that I learned so much from. And you talked about you eliminated two kind of directional trades. But as you um, you start trading your own book and eventually you built your own business, were you taking directional trades or are you trying to market make uh, an option? And that one was a market make. It was just, it happened to be a deep in the money call. So it's 100 Delta, which means if I buy yeah. 57 calls, I'm going to sell 57 futures on it. Um, it was option volatility arbitrage. Like we were market makers. So anything that they called out, you had to make a two-sided market on. And so you were buying or selling and then adjusting your, your, your volatility, you know, in the option prices. I, I always tried to um, have the tails like long, long gamma. So that like if the black swan event or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, the, we called it a three standard deviation move. So a three standard deviation move should happen once every thousand years. But in fact, three standard deviation moves from the models happen every about three years. So we wanted to win. It's a Taleb thing. Like you want to win when, 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 when chaos ensues and vol goes through the roof, you want to, you want to be the person holding some, some ammunition so you can sell it at that point. Um, and then the day trade, the, the, the arbitrage that you do all day long essentially pays for that that long gamma that you've you've got, and then you're going to have decay every day. Like those options are usually going to expire worthless. Um, so we we just were very disciplined about always having positions that never could blow you out. And um, you know, back then, like you know, there's 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 margin in that. It wasn't a, an eighth of a penny. It wasn't yeah. computers doing it. You know, I I learned it. I I got reasonably good at it. I started teaching it to other people. And what I looked for are people that I called corporate refugees. So I started looking around and noticing, hey, there's people like myself who became a lawyer. Um, you know, I had one guy I literally bumped into. I knew him from college. My wife went to high school with him. I bumped into him at a 7-Eleven. What are you doing now? And I, he said, oh, I'm, I'm a medical malpractice lawyer. And I go, wow, like that seems, doesn't, I never would have guessed that. And he goes, oh, I hate it six weeks later, he was working for me for like 15 grand a year as a clerk. Like, so like I would, I would be at like a cocktail party or something like that, or a barbecue. And I could just start sniffing out people that like, were, were like, you know, they say what, you know, people lead lives of quiet desperation. Right. Um, I would kind of seek out those people who I thought were, <laughs> were, were smart, but not smart so much as dedicated and, willing to grind and fast thinkers. Like you don't need to be like broadly intelligent to be a fast thinker. Um, and then we just broke them down psychologically and built them back up. <laughs> I had a guy punch me once. So we used to do a thing where it was just rapid math where I'd go like five times four and you'd say- 20. 20. And then I'd say 734 divided by seven. <laughs> and that's not hard because, you know, it's like, 700 into seven is a is 100 and then the 34 into seven you know you can get it really close right very right. quickly so we would practice that kind of math just like very fast little shortcuts but i got to the point one time where i had a guy because i it was like a drill sergeant in like you know what's that movie with the guy you know <laughs> uh full metal jacket yeah. like you know we'd go full metal jacket on them and we'd have two guys yelling at them just doing math basic math problems to the point where grown men would 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 cry and you go like well that's cruel and terrible and you're it's like no we're your friends the guys in yeah. this is just for pennies after work 
when you're in there, you're going to need to do that. And they're not your friends and they, they're going to try to take your money and your money is going to be my money. So I would like you to be able to do this. But I had one guy that just broke down and he couldn't do like three times seven at some point, And he just punched me in the face. <laughs> And then he apologized. And then he ran off the, the trading floor. And I was just like, okay, we've got you. Now we're going to teach you how to think clearly when, when things hit the fan. It's interesting thinking about that, that training for that. And it's amazing when, when there's money on the line, how quick you get at, at simplifying mental heuristics to be able to do like options math in your head, because you know, there's, there's incentives there. And I was yeah. thinking about actually pre-mortems or, or training like Navy SEALs. So that way, um, you train harder than actual game day in sports, for example. And we'll, we'll talk about that later in 2020 as well. But it made me think about, I never thought about it before in, in this way, is that by by buying those wing options, that's facing, basically you're forcing yourself into do a deterministic pre-mortem. It's because you know you're making money at the money and you're kind of short ball if you have a little bit of asynchronous timing on market making. But you have those deterministic wings on that then when the shit hits the fan and chaos ensues, you can have certain amount of plasticity. Be- yeah, you have optional, uh, optionality, not in the option sense, but you have like you're, you're, you're going to be able to pause, know you're OK, gather yourself and go like, OK, I own you're you're at, you're Eddie Murphy at the end of trading places. Right. You know, you're, everyone's freaking out. And you're just like, I own it all. Like, you know, um, and there was a couple of guys that were really good at that, that were very quiet about it. Um, and like, you'd, you'd watch, like, I remember the first time that I, like the real crazy one happened. It was, it was like Greenspan's irrational exuberant speech. I was trading yen options and, and yen devalued by a chunk all of a sudden. And I looked over and one of the guys who I was, I was like kind of looked up to uh, as a trader and boy, he was tough. Like, you know, um, and he looked at me and he, he was like, and I was like, you know, and he, and he went and he just showed me his sheet and he had 10 times the position that I did in the same direction. And I knew what we were making that day. And I, he goes, I worked seven years waiting for this moment. I'm going to enjoy it. And he probably made $5 million that day. And so he's like, that seven, that's five years, seven years, whatever it was of discipline to have the ability to grind out small profits every day to own that, the thing for when it blows up. Um, you know, he was like, I didn't make that money today. I made that money over the last seven years. And cause I literally said to him afterwards, it was the first time we had a normal conversation, you know, cause he wouldn't talk to me because I was decent you know, and I was a competitor. So I was, I finally said to him, like, how much money did you make today? And he was like, well, I got to tell someone, you know? So he told me and I just went, wow. Like, what do you, what does that feel like? He goes, feels like seven years of work. And that's when I went, yes. Like that's, that's what people don't understand. You know, the paydays that happen in any business are not based on that end cash out thing where the good event happens. They're all the grind that you do every day to get there. That makes me think about, and I obviously want to get to it later, is like talk to 10 year overnight success, right? It's the grind, it's the grind to get there. So, but I, I think about, you know, there's this trope that, you know, nine out of 10 in restaurants fail because, you know, most people it's, it's kind of amateur hour and it's that living room. But what I've learned actually though, is, you know, when you're building out your, your options business and your market making business, what I've found is there's a lot of traders but they don't realize the actual business of running a trading operation. So tell me about like when you're hiring employees and everything, those are two very different things. And a lot of traders can't handle actually the business of managing. Yeah, I will say that I, I probably did a lousy, I did a really good job of hiring the right people and training them well, but I did not do a good job of running the business. Um, if I did, I'd still be doing that probably. Um, you know, it was more like hiring a band of brothers um, and sisters. We had women as well. We were one of the few firms that that had women traders back then. I hired them almost like independent contractors where we would, back then people would back other, you know, back other traders. So I would train people, we would back them. They would start off as my clerk. They'd get a mentorship um, from me. And then I would back them, put money in their account, go over their trades every day and keep that going. And we built that up to, you know, 30 people merged with a firm in New York um, did a whole bunch of other trades. Um, and we did so well, frankly, that we never built out like the infrastructure that you would, that I would now go, oh, well, we need an HR department and we need like support staff and all that. Like 
we would literally just wake up at five in the morning, trade all day, go out to dinner, have a great dinner, stay out till midnight, wake up at five in the morning and do it again. Six days out of seven for years on end. So terrible as a business person then. I was not a business person. I was a trader. That's how we learn. And I wonder now if you think about the high level of athletes now and how they have nutritionists and trainers and everything is like, man, if I could go back to my youth and just eat well, not drink until midnight, I would probably find a better trade. I, actually, I don't think I'd trade it. I had a great, I had a great time. You know, I, 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 um, I will say that I still have the occasional dream probably two or three times a year where I'm handed sheets and I'm back in a pit and I, I, I kind of lucid dream. So I like, I know that I'm dreaming and I'm just like, ah, I get to make markets today. Like, this is so much fun. I, there's, I guarantee you in Chicago, at least, you could open up a pit, have everyone put in five grand, figure out some fake thing to trade and just let all these old guys trade, open outcry, and you would get 50 people to show up every day because yeah. there's nothing like it that exists in the world today. Uh, it is nothing like trading on Robin Hood or whatnot. It was a sport like you said, and it's a sport that doesn't exist anymore. How do you, how do you look at today? Like the world of like the Citadels, Peak Six, Susquehanna, are you just like in awe of like where the industry has gone down to like picoseconds and all this, like in spoofing and dark pools? Are you just yeah, like- Yeah, I mean, I, I'm an investor in, in, in a firm um, from 1999 that has grown to hundreds and hundreds of, of traders and whatnot, like the ones you mentioned, but not any of the ones you mentioned. And um, I, I knew all those guys back then. Like I knew the the Susquehanna early guys and I knew the peak six guys and all that. So they did exactly what I didn't do. They built the business. And so um, it makes complete sense. All it is is the digitization of everything that we were just talking about. Um, we already had worked on it. You know, I, I started coming up with like, uh, um, I called my firm third moment trading um, and it was a statistical weird thing that would take a long time to explain. But it's basically like this theoretical point where you have all of your Greeks go to zero. So it looks like you have no risk at all. That's called the third moment, but it doesn't, it's not, it's a, it's a, it's a fault in the models. And so I thought that that was kind of funny because it's like a black hole of, of a model. Um, and I looked at what, what these other folks were doing and, you know, they built businesses like more power to them, you know, and I've been very fortunate that I invested some money in one of them in 1999. That's grown to, you know, do like, you know, I think they do one out of every eight options that's trades in the world or something like that. And I look at it and they took all of the ideas we had about like the vol, the, there's a vol curve. And then that curve itself as the, at the money moves, that will also move. So it's another layer of derivative on the vol curve. So I knew enough to like know intuitively that I would adjust my market making, um, you know, a couple ticks based on that. But I didn't know I couldn't do the math to model it. Um, Taleb kind of started modeling that out in Dynamic Hedging, um, mm -hmm. one of his books, and I hired a couple of serious math guys to help me model that out. And um, started doing that, started doing some portfolio ETF option arbitrage. So if you take all the options in an ETF, you can sort of model the volatility of it differently and trade all the components. So I started doing all of that, but that required me managing programmers and, and, and quants and, and all of that. And honestly, I, I had less interest in doing that at the time. Like, if I was going to start over now at my age now, I'd be like, yeah, that's great. Get me in that. But I kind of am doing that. I'm just doing it, overlaying it with talk. Exactly. You're, you're competing in a blue ocean space instead of competing against the best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, there's, there's a lot of people way, way smarter than I am doing that now. So I, I, I can't compete anymore. Thinking about um, Trio Restaurant in Evanston in the early 2000s was a, a magical place, especially because of Chef Gray and Ackett's. Did you ever go? Yeah, and there was 20, 2002 or 2003. Yeah. So yeah, it was a very exciting place. And, you know, at that time, it was like really groundbreaking. And, you know, you meet Grant there, you know, are, how, how, kind of, how old were you in, when you and Grant kind of really connected? I was uh, 35, 36, something like that. You had all these war wounds and you'd learned everything from the training spot and, you know, and, and building that business. So you kind of, you kind of have some, uh, some experience under your belt. 
Um, but Grant, you know, obviously wants to go out on his own, like every great young chef does. And so you guys start having some interesting conversations about that. But I wonder, you know, as an entrepreneur, a lot of times, you know, you're dreamers or whatever, and you can, you can really push the envelope and drive the business, but you don't necessarily count the pennies. And sometimes the best chefs are artistic, but also they're very good at like food cost and counting the pennies, but sometimes not. So like, how do you guys like get together and, you know, how do those forces kind of connect? You know, Grant had a ton of ambition. He was like the corporate refugee guy, but having never done corporate, but like I could have hired him if I was still trading, I would have convinced him to stop being a chef Uh, because he was just a driven, he was a winner. Like you can look at someone and just go like, oh, this person's going to win. They're going to figure out how to win. And so he had this like emotional connection with the food, with the experience that people were having and all that. And he was certainly very artistic, but you could also see that he was asking the right questions. Um, you know, he would, he would really measure, like he wasn't one of those chefs that came in the dining room and, and shook everyone's hands and had a glass of champagne and a cigar. And, you know, it's like a party. He was asking people, why did you like this? What did you think of that? Like, why do we even serve bread? Like, I'm just stuffing you up with bread and butter. Like why? So we didn't know each other well. And I, I just couldn't get out of my head. Like this guy is going to be one. Of, he's one of the best in the world at what he does already. And no one knows it. Someone needs to guide him to a, a, a bigger picture because he, he grew up in St. Clair, Michigan um, and in, in a diner and he just hadn't been around the world at all. You know, like he hadn't had the opportunities to see these things. And I think he, he wanted to be great, but he didn't know how good he was. You know, it'd be like finding the the kid on, you know, a Caribbean Island, you know, who's really good at basketball. And you go like, no, you're actually really good. Like we'll take you to Harlem and you'll still be really good. Um, That happened to Donald Foyle. He played at Colgate. Um, And, you know, I, I don't know, like we just, I, I needed a new thing to fully dive into and he needed me. He needed someone like me. He didn't need me particularly, but he needed someone like me to to do that. And we we just found each other at the right moment. I basically, you know, said from the start, this will be a business, not an art project. It'll look Imagine like an that. Art project. It'll look like an art project, but in order to work, it needs to make money because it needs to be self-sustaining. And he was he was amenable to that, you know. Um I will say that like at the time, what I thought was possible and what I began to think what was possible after we got into it were two different things. Um, So, but I I will say I I wrote out a spreadsheet in 2004 before we opened and we had a conversation last week and it was a 20 year spreadsheet. And I was trying to teach him the compounding nature of things. Like this is something people do not understand intuitively, right? And so I was basically like, we're going to start with this crystal here and we're going to go for four years. And then at the end of four years, we are going to get two more, just like backing the traders. And we're going to have two more of these and then we're going to do a book, but we're not going to do a publisher. Like I had that in there. And I said, I'm sure like half these things will not occur, but they'll be, they're like a placeholder for something else some other opportunity that will come in. We're in a very fortunate position right now. And he was like, holy shit, you were within 5% of that 16 years ago. I think that was the exact phrase. And he was just like, I, I, he's like, I still don't understand how or why you did that. Like, he was very thankful. Like he called me being very thankful. And he was like, um, which we don't do with each other. I mean, you yeah. know, like it's, it's not like we're, we're you know, we're, we're guys. So we don't like call and say like, hey, by the way, thank you very much. Um, but we had that thing of just looking backwards as we're reopening um, Alinea after COVID, you know, yesterday was the first day back. And we just had kind of like a, a little bit of a, a moment to pause and reflect. And, and, you know, I had pulled that spreadsheet for other reasons and sent it to him. I said like, hey, look at this. And he was just like, I can't believe that. <laughs> like, you know, so it was it's planning like this stuff, math works, you know? 
Yeah, it's, and you had like there, and like you said, there's somewhat nebulous ideas, and you, you found your way to those kind of points in time. And I think about too, like you're just saying, is like there's no there there. Like we accomplished all these goals, we should pause and say this is great, but that's not the end. It's it's the process. It's the daily grind. That's if you don't find joy in creative problem solving every day, there's no uh, rest period. Like it's it's always it's always grinding every day, and that's that's the joy of entrepreneurship is creative problem solving. Um, I think about most people don't know that fine dining just loses money and they don't realize this places like El Boulier was basically subsidized by Telefonica and like all of these things. So it was a really um, shocking idea you had. It sounds so simple, but you wanted fine dining that actually had a business that made money. I, I think this is the first thing you said that I disagree with. Great. great. Uh, I, so Please. I think that um, there is this notion, myth building almost, that these places don't make a lot of money and these guys are artists, you know? Not true. Like, the best restaurants in the world make money. And do you know how I knew that even before I built one? They build another one. (laughs) There's no way that if I came to you and said, hey, I got this great idea, Jason. Like, I want to build another Alinea. And guess what? It loses $3 million a year. You're not going to, no matter how much you like our food, you'd rather just show up and die and, and you're not going to invest a million dollars in building the second millennia, right? So I talked to a chef just before we were going to open Alinea who had five restaurants. And I said to him, I said, yeah, I'm going to build a, a restaurant with Grant. And he knew who Grant was. And he goes, oh, Grant's going to be a star, but you don't want to get into this business. You know, it's terrible business, low margins, blah, blah, blah. And I said, why did you build four more? And, and he had no answer. Like, yeah. I mean, he was probably laundering money or something. I don't know. But like, you know, I, I, I very much, one of the things that most, if you want to really like, there's only one thing that really triggers me at all. And that's when people say, oh, well, you can do that because you're a linea. No. And what I say is, no, we're a linea because we do that. So what is that? Well, we got rid of phones. We got rid of tipping 10 years ago. We pay a 401k to our employees. Like all of these things that were risky um, are actually good business practice. And so when people say, well, you can get away with that because you're Alinea, I said, no, a thousand small decisions like that made Alinea what it is. I want to push back in a positive way, actually, is to your point, you actually changed the paradigm that it was possible to run a three Michelin star restaurant that made money. And it, so it was a, it was a trope Maybe before because I, I feel like they must've, some of them must've been making money. That's all I'll say. Here's, here's my pushback though. The ones that very, very rarely were people opening up multiple three Michelin starred restaurants. They were opening up like more casual fine, you know, fine dining. And yeah. then as you know, too, they were, there were a lot of times just cycling in new investors that wanted to have that, you know, That's seat true. at the bar and get the discount or whatever. Yeah. Or, I call it making it your living room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's, you know, that that happened a lot. But what I think is another interesting part of the Alinea story um, that's been talked a lot of, about a lot, but I don't think people think about um, kind of the, the old trope that like, we'll see, like anything that bad that happens to you, we'll see what the long run turnout is, right? So you're 18 months into Alinea, your partner Grant gets, you know, stage four cancer. He probably doesn't have long to live. Um, and so you guys are going through this unbelievable crisis, but during that crisis, you end up coming into the restaurant more and working at night trying to help out a little bit more. So you start to see maybe all of those, once again, going back to that, those anger or annoyances, like there's all these little details that, why is this like this? Why is this like this? And you're like, that doesn't make any sense to me. So out of that comes a lot of, of, of beautiful ideas. And one of which is next, but kind of, kind of take me back to, you know, working in the restaurant at night, um, you know, yeah. having staff meal or whatever. I was never a service prof- service professional, right? My role at the restaurant was do the business side, do the do the bookkeeping, hire the people who knew wine and, and all that sort of stuff and the service. We would, Grant and I would make up the service protocols that were different than a normal restaurant. But so I had input into that, but I wouldn't be the one to train the staff or to be there overseeing them at night. So they really didn't know what I did. And then all of a sudden when he was sick, we had some attrition because people were concerned that they wouldn't have a job in six months. So, so some of our best people started leaving 
And so I was like, wow, I, I need to be there to, to oversee this and let them know that like, we're going to weather through this and, and we, the business isn't going anywhere. It's, it'll be fine. And so I would just start like hanging out during the day, answering phones, you know, and, and, and taking reservations. And I did that like one day a week prior to that, but doing it every day was very different. And I started to annoy all of our, all of our staff members because I would be like, that's really not the way to do that, you know? And they would kind of go like, well, you don't know what you're doing because you're not here every day, right? And that's a fair criticism actually. And so I'd be like, okay, well now I'll be here every day. So teach me how to do this job. And, you know, I just started noticing like weird, inexplicable things like, hey, we have a waiting list of 50 people. It's Wednesday. On Saturday, we at the time, we did 90 people, but on Wednesday, we did 74, but we have a waiting list. And I know we're capable of doing 90. That 16 people is a massive difference. Like that's your whole profit right there. And I remember I went up to our GM at the time, note at the time, and said, why are we doing 74 people on a Wednesday, but 90 on a Saturday? Like, Tuesday is just a different name or Wednesday is just a different name. And he said, oh, well, you can't like begin the week with 90. I was like, why not? Well, it's, you know, we're just getting our rhythm and like, we're getting into it. And like, you know, the prep is a little different. And I'm like, we can have people come in and prep Tuesday, like when we were closed then. And we'll just have them prep and then we'll do 90 on Wednesday too. And you can just see him going, oh, my lifestyle is going to suck. Like, like a thousand percent, there was not this urgency because I hadn't aligned their incentives the same. My incentive was to do 90 people. If that 90 was our maximum we could do, we would do 90 every single day of the week that we were open. Their incentive was to go, okay, well, Saturdays are the busy day where we all know that the whole staff is going to be tired and, and hustling and all that. And I just said to him, I'm like, look, if we did 90 people every day, we could hire another six people. <laughs> Exactly. Like, this is not that, right? You know what I mean? This is like, it, your job should get easier, not harder. And that is a, an, a thing that I've had to deal with f till this day still. Um, because like in 2019, I was like, we have demand to go seven days a week. And everyone said the same thing. People are going to grind themselves to a halt. The chefs are not going to want to pull back. If you're the executive chef of the restaurant, you want to be there every night. I said, well, we'll have two executive chefs and they'll work four days a work week each and we'll pay them both more. So they have three-day weekends. And actually, it works out economically. Now, some of the people that work there went like, but not, then we'll lose money. I'm like, the last money in is the money you keep because your fixed costs get to be a smaller and smaller percentage of everything. So we, we I, you know, I'll just say we the first year we opened Alinea, we did about five million dollars in sales. In 2019, we did 23 million. That's with, unreal. With 70 unreal. seats. So all of those, all of those stats that you read of the top hundred grossing restaurants, which I hate, no one's gonna I'm not gonna call up some magazine and be <laughs> like, oh yeah, here's you know, no, 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 we should be slotted in at number 12. Yeah. Like, you know, nobody is gonna do that, you know. Um, and I certainly didn't think that was possible, but over the course of 15 years of building up a reputation and building up, um, operations, um, we, we, we were able to grow that much. And that's a, that's like four and a half X what we started out with. And, and we, our first year, we did double what trio did the year before. So literally from grants from 2004, we are 10 X in 15 years. Wow, that's same incredible. Same number of seats, same floor print. And I want to get into like those different um, business sectors that actually go into the restaurant because I think that's part of the fascinating story. But I think the story is best told actually through Next is like like you said, there's all these in, entrenched ideas always in restaurants and there's a lot of sclerosis where everybody's just doing the same thing they've always done. They never question it, but you coming in and asking questions of like, why do we do it this way? Um, and maybe avoiding Chesterton fences where, you know, maybe there's a reason, maybe there's not, but you d keep digging at it, gnawing at it for, for years at a time. That's what's not told. It's like, you didn't just change it overnight. You found out why, right? And then, so when you're, when you're going to build next, you know, you have this, this idea where you have, 
I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that Grant made you a, a, a duck? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 roughly correct. The, the day that he was diagnosed with cancer, I mean, people always take this the wrong way. Like, um, I was in Michigan and he called and, and I answered the phone. He just said, it's cancer. And I knew it was bad. Like, I, you know, it, I knew he was young, non-smoker, non-drinker, like all those things. And just... Uh, I unfortunately had enough exposure to people who had, who had cancer at a young age that, so I immediately drove, I quit what I was doing, drove down, um, and got there and he was just working and he hadn't told anyone. And obviously he was freaking out mentally. I mean, I could only imagine. Right. And I hadn't eaten all day. And when I got there, I said to him, I'm like, are you okay? And he's like, no, nah, not really. You know, but like, I'm like, why are you working? He goes, what am I going to do? Like, there's nothing to do right now. So I might as well do this. What people don't understand is that like the only place I think um, Grant is fully comfortable and fully himself is in a kitchen. He's an expert. He knows exactly what's going on. He's like a ballerina on stage. And so like, he's just like an efficiency of motion and all that. And he said to me, are you hungry? And I dumbly answered, yes. Like, I, but I didn't think, I didn't know what was going to happen. Right. And cause I've never eaten at like in the kitchen of Alinea. You don't do that. Like, that's the kind of thing. Like I remember the very first night we were open or second night, they were throwing away food that hadn't gone out to the table. So if, if it gets on a runner, it doesn't go under a heat lamp. It like the runner stands there and if someone gets up and goes to the bathroom, they throw that food away and make another one. So people don't know that. So don't go to the bathroom in between, you know, make sure you, you finish your bite, you go to the bathroom because otherwise exactly. you just throw the food away, which is incredibly wasteful. So I thought that was incredibly wasteful and I hadn't eaten in two days and was still laying tile in the basement myself. So I scraped it onto a, a, in a bowl and I went in the back alley and I started eating and Grant came out and went, what the hell are you doing? You can't do that. And I went, I'm, it's, it was going to go in the garbage. And he said, no, no, no. As soon as everybody sees you do that, they're going to look for reasons to throw away the food and eat it instead. So you don't want that. So I didn't think he was going to make me dinner because you don't eat meal in your kitchen, except when it's family meal time. And they, made up a quick duck breast and all that. And I just had my mind like, like whipped up instantly. One of the best French dishes I've ever had in my life. Nothing like what we were serving that day. And years later when he was through cancer and, and we were looking at what to build, I went back to him, like, you know, we should do that. Like, like you've got that in your back pocket and no one believes it. And we do, we're doing this hyper modern thing. So if we do this really old thing, everyone will, will be like, wow, like versatility, right? Um, and he went, oh, I'll get bored in three months. And I kind of went, yeah, so we'll just do something else. Just be the best Italian restaurant. And that's the, that was the seed of the idea uh, for Next is, hey, it solves the problem of, you know, the new restaurant town is always busy. Everyone wants to check out the new place. Everyone always wants to know what's next. That's it. It was just that, you know, it's that simple over a two-year conversation, of course. But um, as soon as he said to me, well, what kind of French food, like what year is it from? Then I knew we were done. I started looking for real estate the next day because I was like, Paris 1906. Like, I want to go eat that. That's a time machine. It's really cool. And that's a story I can tell and write and market and all of that. But I wonder about the gut instinct of like, when you know parent, you know Paris 1906, that's it. Like right away is like, and that's where you go out and look for real estate right away. I wonder, we wonder, is that different at 19 versus 35? Like you've built up enough life experience and you're, you're marinating on the idea for years. And then it, when it's, it clicks, you had that gut experience. You don't need a business plan or anything. You just know right away, that's the scenario. But like, how do you think we develop that over time? Is it just through giving our subconscious enough ideas to marinate on enough experience? I don't know, but you know, when you hear an elevator pitch for anything, you know the ones that really hook you. You know, the snakes on a plane thing, right? Like just, it's, it's, it's just funny, right? Like, you know, you, like that whole thing, it's a dumb movie. It's a, I've never actually seen the movie, but we all know the pitch snakes on a plane. It's funny for me. It's like a marketing hook. And it's also goes back to the philosophy thing. If you understand something, you can write it really short. 
Um, and so I could tell the story of that restaurant in three sentences. And that meant I really understood it. I understood what we were selling. I understood that people would understand it. And I myself would want to go to it. You know, um, I myself would go like, yeah, let's take the best chefs in the world and, and have them do a different cuisine in the same space every four months. That's an interesting problem. But as a diner, that's exciting. I can go back to the same place three times a year, get totally different meals. Some of them will be great. Some of them, maybe not, you know, but it's, it's exciting. Like you want to see what happens. Just a couple of things I want to touch on there. One is like getting to that point where you can get down to the three sentences. It sounds great, but you didn't sit down a blank sheet of paper. You've been marinating on the ideas for years and honing years. it down. Yeah, years. Yeah, that's that's what people miss about that. It just doesn't happen that quickly. The other one was like thinking about Grant being able to, you know, there was never a good word, but let's call it modernist cuisine. Is people, like you said, didn't realize he could do the classical traditional stuff per, with perfection. I think like Goya said, until like you can paint like the masters, you can't, yeah, you know, go off Picasso. and start like, yeah, you know, like avant -garde. I think people who don't know art think of Picasso as all the abstract stuff. Right. And they don't, then they look at what he painted when he was 12 and they're like, oh my God, like, look at that. Um, it's the same thing, you know? And to me, that was always the interesting thing. Like I loved art, art history. I, I could, I, I think that, you know, Grant didn't have a background in art. So like when we finally got to London, I was like, we're going to go to Tate Modern and you're going to learn about James W. Turner and you're going to do all these things. And I would take him to all the museums and give him lectures in art history. I mean, I lived in London for a year studying art history and, and theater and stuff. He didn't want to go. He found it intimidating. And I was like, no, it's the same thing. It's just like another art form. And people have gone through these same thought processes and we can apply the same ideas to the restaurants. And really next was applying a theater model to a restaurant. And I wonder, like, I think it was fair and Andrea said something like, if food wasn't so uh, quotidian, if we didn't eat three times a day, we would elevate that level of art to similar as painting and sculpture and theater. A thousand percent. He's the real deal. Like I've been, one of my great joys is that like in 2003 or whatnot, like I, I got the LBE book and I started like trying to cook through it and all that. And I've gotten to eat dinner and spend time with Ron now. And, and he's, he's not only an artist, he's a cagey dude. Like he's smart, you know, like he's a good marketer that I know what parts are bullshit, what are real now. Like, you know, um, I would ask him questions and he would just look at me and, and like, you know, he claims he doesn't speak English, but he does. And, and he would look at me and he would be like, uh, don't ask me that. Like, that's, you're, you're, you're kind of poking the veil through the veil then, you know? So I, all art is also commerce and all commerce is art. And I, there's this notion, especially in the restaurant business, that if you are this artist, you shouldn't be great at the business side it's actually looked down upon like an indie rock band or something yeah. like that. And what I always try to explain to, to young chefs when they call me is like, you need to, you either need to become partners with someone you trust desperately and intimately on all of the spreadsheets and, and math and, and HR and all that, or you need to learn it yourself and love it. Because once you open your own restaurant, 60, 70% of your job, if you don't have that person, is going to be that. And I see it time and time and time again, where they open a restaurant, they think they're just going to like great food, great service. That's all that matters. And they forget all the other things that you need to do to, you know, it's like the field of dreams thing. Like if you build it, they will come. Yeah. No. Not if they don't know about it, they won't. That's why I, was, why I brought it up. Like the counting the pennies or nickels before. I think like Safi Bacall wrote this great book, uh, Loon Shots, talking about you need to combine the artists and the soldiers. And rarely does one person have that combination. So you need to find partners that combine in that way. And That's I want to go back. You said, you know, when you open next, it was thinking about it almost like a theater. Um, I think about it often is that people go, you know, you have to think about what you're doing and what you're selling. And people go, okay, I'm competing against other Chicago restaurants at this caliber. And I'm like, no, you're not you're competing on entertainment. You're competing with yeah. Netflix. You're competing against all the other entertainment in the world for that night. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's the entertainment industry. And because we need to eat to survive and the fortunate people among us get to eat every day, you know, a couple times a day, um, it's so wrapped up in our culture, right? Like, I think if Next opened up now, people would say that there's cultural appropriation. 
And what I'm saying is, is like, no, we're trying to learn from those cultures. We're not trying to steal from them and, and make them white or any of those things. What we're doing is we're going, we love Thai food. So we're going to learn and examine all the things that exist in Thai food. And we're going to honor it by trying to do our version of it, you know? And to me, like, that's an interesting problem. Like, you know, it's like, let's take people who cook in one way and then who are passionate about cooking and who live to learn that stuff, give them a whole new color palette. Give them exactly. all, the, all the Thai ingredients and whatnot and see what they do with it, you know? So I felt like people would be excited by that. And it, it turned out that they, they were, fortunately. And that's what next was a, a revolutionary idea. But then you doubled down on revolutionary ideas and probably coming from the time you had spent, you know, on the Florida linea and learning how everything worked was then you decided to create this ticket system of variable pricing or pre-selling tickets to, to next. And that yeah. led to a cascade of events that are just phenomenal. I just like couldn't believe that we would, we would book, people would book reservations at Alinea and then simply ghost them. Like, you know, so we had eight, six to eight people a day that simply wouldn't show up. And, or we'd have people book a table of six and show up as two. And you could tell when they got there that they were, that they were just lying that the other couples, oh, they're late. They're not coming. They just booked the six top because it was the only thing available. So over the course of a year, I just, I literally kept track of it. We lost $580,000 of revenue in a year. Like, and, and I started going like, well, let's call everybody. I did everything that every other restaurant owner still does. I called them ahead. I held a credit card. I did everything. And the answer was, if it, none of it worked, you know, it's like you might have little successes, but you also had people pissed off and you weren't keeping the credit card in a PCI compliant way. And if you tried to charge people afterwards, they'd say, my grandmother died, my dog died. Like, you know, I got a flat tire. They would come up with all these excuses and then they would blame you. And the person on the phone, they would say like, you're being terribly mean. Like you didn't even serve me the food. Why didn't you just give it to someone else? And we're like, well, we don't have a bar there for people just to stand at hoping they're going to get a table. So I was like, at one point, I just blurted out, like, you know, if to on the phone to someone, I said, you know, if you bought a tickets to a Cubs game and and you got a flat tire, you don't call the Cubs and say, I can I might can I my ticket back? <laughs> you know, like the game goes on without you. Um, and. I had in my head, like, we should just, we should just charge. Like, like if I go to the theater or a concert or a movie, you charge. And everybody, including Grant, told me it was a terrible idea. And so when we announced Next, I, I had, we made like a little film trailer, which was actually a really cool thing to do at the time too. And Martin Kastner and I did the whole thing. I did the music for it and, and mapped out the visuals and storyboarded it. And it said, tickets, yes, tickets on sale soon. Man, I, I painted myself into a corner there because I thought like I would get a theater ticket company or Ticketmaster or OpenTable would give me access to their API. But I didn't really realize how like a concert starts all at once. You have assigned seating, but there's a go time that everyone leaves at once. And the problem of configuring the tables and selling them started looking a lot like an options market to me. And I realized that I would have to build it. I would have to build their own software. So I hired a single programmer 12 weeks before opening. And uh, it was, it was hell. Like, you know, it was a great, it was a great hell, but it was hell um, because had to figure it out, had to map out the problem, had to flow chart it, had to put it up on Rackspace. I'd never put anything on, on a, a cloud server before. Had to figure out how to um, use authorized.net, take credit cards compliantly. Like all this stuff needed to be programmed from scratch. And in 12 weeks, um, we built the prototype to it. As soon as we turned it on, it broke because I thought there was gonna be 400 people and there was 14,000 or so that were hitting the refresh button we did the marketing too well, but finally got it going and um, sold $562,000 of tickets to a restaurant in the first day. And I, it was, it still is one of my most satisfying moments of my entire life because I was like, I looked like the big Lebowski, right? I was walking around in a robe with like pizza boxes and empty wine bottles laying around my little office 
and hadn't shaved in a week. And I was like, the I had become obsessed. Like I was completely obsessed with trying to make this work to the point where I didn't buy telephones for the restaurant because if I knew that if I had bought a telephone, I wouldn't feel truly under the gun. But also that, that satisfaction came also, let's be honest, from like, I told you so, just like going back to the trading floor when they told you you're never going to make it. Thousand we're percent. also driven by that anger. Oh, of like, I'm going to fucking show you. I'm going to yeah, show you. Like I'm gonna all, make all, I think all ego and ambition is driven by fear of just looking like an idiot, right? Yeah. At least for me, it is. Yeah. So like, I, I, I remember Grant called me that morning before we turned it on. We had opening night and he said, how many should I plan for tonight, chef? And when he calls me chef, that is not, the way I call him chef. That's like, yeah. that's yeah. like going, okay, big shot. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, okay, Mr. Computer chef. Yeah. You know, how many should we plan for? And I said, how many do you want tonight? And he said, I want 50. I said, plan for 50, cook for 50. I mean, I was literally going to go down there and just drag people off the street if I needed to, you know? And at like two in the afternoon when it was working and we had sold out that night and any time I could hit a table in the future, I could open it up it would sell so fast that the color would go from yellow, which was a held table to green, which was available to the public to red, which was sold. And it would do it so fast. I thought the system was broken, but then I would see in authorized.net, I would see the credit card charge and the name. And then I would see the name in our system as a reservation. And I was like, any day I hit, I could hit three weeks from Wednesday on at nine o'clock at night, double click it. So, and I was like, holy cow, this is crazy. This is so much better than I had. I had imagined it good. And this is so much better. And I called Grant up and I was like, um, get over here. And he's like, uh, we're opening a restaurant tonight. I was like, that's the guy who saved your life. Get over to my house right now, you know? And he showed up looking really annoyed. And I, I looked like hell. He was like, you look like hell. And I was like, just get over here. And I said, click that button. And he didn't really, he was like, what am I doing? And I'm like, you're making a table bill. And he goes, okay, what happened? I go, it's sold. And then I had the authorized.net on another screen. I'm like, $462.50. It'll be in our bank account in two days. They're dining in a month. And then it all clicked for him. And he went, oh my God. And so he started clicking a couple and they all sold. And he goes, how long do you think this will last? I go, forever. And, and he just went, okay, I'm going to go cook. <laughs> and that was it. But I was, I was like literally running laps around my house inside going, I can't believe this worked. And then I also like six months later kind of went, Oh, this is like a responsibility now. <laughs> like, like almost like I knew something that other people didn't. And I felt like it was going to change the industry. And then I spun it in my head going like, well, if I don't do it, someone else is going to do it. Like, cause it's an inevitable thing. It's kind of like when you discover something that like always existed, like I didn't invent it. It was just there. And I went like, oh, there it is. I think about like, the interesting part to me is too, you had been thinking about this idea for a long time and then yeah. you weren't risk taking, you were risk averse. You hired one programmer and you worked on it for like six to 12 weeks and you just yeah. grinded it out. So you had very low risk versus exponential upside, which has, has manifested over the next 10 yeah. to 12 years. Which is, which is even more fascinating to me, but also what was driving you crazy is it was there's so much opacity in restaurants. And so now you had an informational arbitrage and almost like you were living in the future. Yeah, I, I still think like, so here's, you know, I, I don't want to flash forward to the end, but like one of the things that's still bizarre to me, and it took me a long time to understand it, is like the whole ritual of check dropping is an incredible waste of time and inefficient. Also leads to about 2% theft. Um, little known fact, like people change the tips, right? So like that whole thing of like the universal signal, check, please wave down the guy. Oh, he's not looking at me. Okay. Yeah. Wave, wave him down. Hey, that's not my table. They drop a physical piece of paper in a little folder on your table. You drop a piece of plastic. They go run it. They bring it back. You write in a tip, you sign it. They have to go back to the, to the POS system type in your tip amount manually, and then you're done. That whole dance, even if it's efficient and takes five minutes, three minutes, whatever it is, on the course of diners over the course of a year has incredible labor waste. 
incredible, you know, inefficiency of, of the time of that table. Like, you oh, it's only three minutes. Well, it's three minutes, three times a night, seven nights a week, 365 days a year. I mean, it's, it's a lot. And then um, we have phones everywhere else you go now, like you're in an Uber. What was cool about Uber is you just, I, how many times have you walked out of a taxi because you forgot it wasn't an Uber and you just don't pay. And they're like, Hey, wait, you need to pay. Yeah. Like I, I've done that. Right. I think everyone's done that now. That's what's going to happen in restaurants for sure. Very soon. And the reason that it hasn't has solely to do with card present versus card, not present rates. And the U S card companies allowing biometric data to count as card present. Why don't they let your fingerprint count as card present without an NFC chip? Well, the reason they don't is because they get 80 basis points more. Exactly. That's it. And so we're going to skip past that like completely. Like we're going to build out something where it's going to be a direct ACH payment. When you create a talk account two years from now, a year from now, whenever we can get it done, you're going to basically put in your bank info, um, and when you go to pay your check, all your bills going to be on there. You're going to be able, if I think tipping is going to go away, I hope it does. There's a lot of reasons why it should, but if it's still there, you'll add a tip and you'll pay walking down the street and it'll go, it'll skip the credit card. It'll go right to the, right to the, um, restaurant and the restaurant will pay a much lower take rate on that. And you will have instant, um, you know, instant payment. And if you want credit, great. We'll, we'll, we'll extend it so you can pay your, your dining bill at the end of the month, but we'll give you a whole bunch of other benefits to do that. Yeah, it's fascinating where we're going to come out and how you know demand pulled that forward a lot from COVID as well. And I think about when what was driving you nuts, especially with the ticketing system, is also like not controlling the customer data so you can provide better hospitality and just this decision-making or opacity. But also, I think the fascinating thing when you, in parallel, you are also doing um, working on publishing and disrupting the entire publishing industry and also figuring out if I market this to the right customers, I can control that data flow as well, which is fascinating. But I think the most interesting piece that tick, like the tickets and then eventually talk led to, and I, I, I envy your epiphany moment, when you figured out that you could prepay your food suppliers and which yeah. is the largest cost in running a restaurant and how that changes the entire dynamic if you're also selling the tickets to the restaurant, so you know exactly how many people you have coming in for prefix menus, and, and you can pre-order your beef, for example. Yeah, here's the crazy thing is that even if you don't do what you just described, even if you are a normal a la carte restaurant, you should just accrue a couple months of, of profits and then call your vendors instead of getting net 90 or net 120, say, hey, if I prepay you for this, we'll estimate how much I'm gonna use. Even if you're buying burgers at a burger place, it's a la carte you can pretty much estimate about how much you're going to sell in July. So prepay for that. And, you know, I saw a lot during COVID of restaurant owners, famous restaurant owners going on CNN and saying, this is the kind of business that you are paying for last month's costs with next week's receipts. And I just kept going like, well, you're not running the business very intelligently. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that was one of those things where we had money in the bank because we were selling tickets. Um, and I called a meat purveyor because we were going to go through, you know, 400 pounds of, of um, dry aged ribeye per, per week at next. And it was about $38 a pound um, because it was a small ranch and it was dry aged and all that. And I said, well, what if I write you a check for $300,000 for the next couple months? and tomorrow, and what kind of discount do you give me? So the math I had done in my head was, was option math. It's like cost of carry, like how much is that money worth for that month? Well, not much, but something, you know, the interest rates are super low. What is the default rate? How many people don't pay him at all? What is the value of cash in pocket? And um, what's, his, what's his waste? You know, like he's not gonna put as much on the rack to dry if, if he knows exactly what I'm buying. And he called me back the next day. He said, well, no one's ever asked me this before, but I'll go down to 1980 a pound, half. I was expecting 4% discount. If he had given me a 5% discount, I would have been ecstatic. And he went down to half. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you 22 a pound if you explain to me in detail why. And I was like expecting like a spreadsheet to come the next day and it was going to be work for him. And he just went, oh, that's easy. Like, we slaughter the cows, we put them on drying rack at between 15 and 30 days, that's peak. I go to work to sell all that. At 45 days, there's a few steakhouses that want it. At 90 days, no one wants it. And it 
I sell it for a dollar pound for dog food. Think about how, first of all, bad for the environment that is. Yeah. Bad for the animals. Wasteful on every level. And that is the ag system for restaurants. Not just that. Because people don't know what they need. So there's so much food waste built into the cost of, of restaurants. And um, that was a moment where I went, we need to hire a person whose sole job it is to call our purveyors and say, what if we prepaid you? And so now for wine, meat, fish, like any of the high priced items, anybody who will talk to us on that and give us a discount, we, we, we do that. And it's, we, we have a person whose job it is to do that. And like, I can't, like some big hotel organizations, there are companies, this is something I learned, that do that on behalf of large organizations. And they do it really terribly, actually. <laughs> they do a bad job estimating what they need. And they do a bad job aggregating the demand and negotiating because they, they essentially become the middle person. And they just take, you know, they give the 5% discount, but they're probably getting 30 if we can, through transparency, if we can reduce uncertainty through that supply chain, it's amazing how we can reduce waste and everybody can be better off. And I think about like, I really want to um, get to 2020. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to kind of skip over how you completely disrupted and revolutionized the publishing and self-publishing industry. But I, I highly recommend people go to your Medium article where you break down all the costs. And that's what I, I want to get to because your transparency is so helpful in so many industries. It makes me think, you know, somebody's going to eventually going to make the biopic of Nick Kikonis because you've actually revolutionized a lot of industry. I know you're going to be humble about it, but it's just it's just blatantly true. It's kind of fascinating with all the different things you've done. But speaking of that transparency, if we think about 2020, and I want to take it in four steps because it was your your journey was really fascinating to me. You had the first step of like kind of a pre-mortem, like what would happen if 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 uh, coronavirus comes to the shores of America. So yeah, that pre, I want to talk about what you did in the restaurants, you know, during that event. I want to talk about what you did with talk during that time. And then also like how you're coming out of it and what you're doing now. So I want to go back. So let's go back to like the pre-mortem, you know, how did you start setting up, like maybe thinking paranoid about what could potentially happen? Well, this takes us full circle back to the long gamma of the tails, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I mean, it's not that long ago. We can remember like, hearing about it and seeing it you know they're like i remember the first memory i have of it is is watching some of the disinfectant going through the streets of china going well that seems like overkill like i remember everyone going like that'll never happen here and they, i was like wow that's crazy it's dystopian it's weird it looks like it's out of a movie and then i remember seeing um, we had about 20 restaurants in Hong Kong that use talk. We don't sell there actively, but they found us. And all of a sudden, like all the reservations were at zero. Like I was like, well, let me look at the Hong Kong restaurants. And I went, oh, there are no Hong Kong restaurants right now. And I went, oh, and then we had a few in Italy and then those shut down. And then when in Seattle, there was that nursing home, unfortunately, that had a number of coronavirus cases where, um, you know, residents had passed away, um, I saw a 30% reduction in reservations in Seattle. And this is before, you know, at the time, our, our, our government leaders, even there, were going, yeah, we got this under control. And it reminded me of the 2008 financial crisis when some of the auto manufacturers and, and bankers, I mean, the Lehman guys, I mean, I remember watching them on TV and going, that guy's lying. <laughs> you know, he's talking his position like, yeah. oh, we're fine. We're not over leverage. And I was like, that looks like the guys on the floor who say, oh, I can't blow out. We're Lehman Brothers. We're not going to blow out. And I remember watching the guy from Ford, whoever the president was at that time, decline tarp money. And Ford was trading all the way down at like $1.80 or something like that. And I bought the $4 calls that day because I was like, this is the first guy talk, telling the truth. He's the only guy who's not over levered and, and knows that he's going to survive this, this financial crisis. Similarly, like I was like, I need to be that guy. Like now I was sitting right where I am now going, oh my God, I have counterparty risk for all the top clients, $30 million of counterparty risk. I have, you know, my own restaurants. This was in February. It was February 28th of last year. Um, and I started getting this kind of existential dread that, I am, I do not have risk protection. Like the, 
the, the three standard deviation event is happening and I do not, I am not de-risked. And I'm certainly, I'm, I'm not only am I not de-risked, I, I would like to go the other way on it. <laughs> like I would like to, I'd like yeah. to win. Yeah. And I just remember going like, I need to, I literally said to my wife, I need to go into trader mode. So running a restaurant, running a software company is definitely not trader mode. I do not run through the place going, you do this, you do that. But in, in trader days, if you saw a trade, you would go sell 80,000 shares. And like, that is not a suggestion. That is the person on the other end of that just executes it, right? So we, I, I kind of called Steve Bernanke, who's my CFO of Talk and COO of Alinea Group. And I said, like, we need plans. And, and I called some doctors um, that I know, epidemiologists. I called everyone I knew who was a scientist and said, what do I need to do to do risk mitigation at my restaurants? And they basically said the basic stuff, hand washing, temperature checks, like everything that we all know now. And when I told our staff, our, our managers, that we had to do hourly hand washing, they went like, this is a guy who clearly doesn't work in a restaurant because you can't stop every hour and wash your hands in a Michelin yeah. a restaurant. And one of the guys kind of smirked. And I just said, I made a list as well of all of the people in order of of when they get laid off starting three weeks from now, you were like 37th on the list. Now you're first. <laughs> and literally Grant was like, dude, you've lost your mind. Like after the meeting, he's like, no one's going to work for us. I go, that's correct. It's, it's wartime general peacetime wartime. You're just, and I, I literally just, he was, I go, I go, that's correct. No one's going to be working for us in two weeks. Like they're going to close down dining and w- it's all going to shit. We're going to have to like figure out what to do. We're going to need to sell carry out. Like people are still going to need to eat. No one's going to want a $350 luxury meal. And we're going to need to do carry out. And I was like, you got to sell it for 35 bucks, which means your food cost is $10. Good luck. And he did not want to do it at first. I mean, that's not why he got into it. It's not why we built the place. And the one thing I'll say about Grant is that as soon as like, if I say, like, I got this. Like, you're just going to have to trust me or vice versa, by the way, too. Like, if he says that, it's his kitchen. Like, he's that confident. I'm going to back off. So we built up a relationship over 15 years. Well, if I look at him and go, do it, just do it. Like, you'll understand it in three weeks. Just do it. He's like, okay. And, you know, he called me up and said, like, okay, I'm doing like, you know, I'm doing, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, short rib beef uh, Wellingtons. And he, he, at first he said like, well, the beef Wellingtons are going to be like $80 each because I'm using 7X beef from the ranch in Colorado. I said, no, 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 like $10 food cost. He was like, well, I guess we get short ribs. Yeah. So, you know, the first night we like, I remember Alex Hayes or one of our business guys templated out the night for the same service, like 128 to go meals. And then people are going to pick them up between 5 PM and 9 PM. I go, who the hell's eating dinner at 10 o'clock during a pandemic? I'm like, we need 500 pickups between four and five 30 because people are then going to take it home and cook it for dinner. Like this is not the same business as usual. We did 500 the first night and Grant's like, oh, this is way easier than normal service. I'm like, of course it is. Like you're not doing a normal night at Alinea is 20 course meals for 128 people. That's 3000 dishes. So doing exactly the same thing, it's boring, but you know, like it's easy. So by day two, he was like, take it up to 750. By the following week, we had built software for two way text messaging and we were selling 1250 a night. And we hired back in two weeks, we hired back like 68 of 88 people there. Um, we did for between March and December, we did 135,000 carry out meals out of, out of um, Alinea alone. Um, 65,000 supplements, thousands and thousands of bottles of wine. Um, we replaced about 75% of our revenue for the year, but our, all of our other costs went down because we weren't open 10 hours a day. It makes me, by the way, I, I owe you actually a personal thank you because honestly, because of your reputation and respect in the industry, and then because of your transparency on Twitter. And when you were talking about, we're making mandatory hand washings, we're, you know, and you're going to be videotaped, like you have to show up on time, like you cannot do all these things. Like 
because you were putting those out in real time, I had members of my own family that were using you as air cover at the restaurants they worked to try to get people to implement those things that were people that were maybe have been turtling in that scenario. Yeah, I, I had a lot of um, people like giving me heat about it. Like, like we would inevitably, I knew we were going to get a COVID case. Of course, like you can't exist without doing it. What we wanted to do was make sure that we had no community transmission. So even within our own staff, we always said like, if you don't want to come into work, you do not have to come into work and you will, your healthcare will be paid for throughout the whole thing as long as it lasts. And we will do our very best to have a job for you when you want to come back and you feel safe. That said, like you don't get to dictate what we serve or how we do it. Like you can choose not to participate, but you can't tell me, no, 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 we need to do this or we need to do that. Like we're going with the science and we're also trying to save our business. And it was very, very, very challenging throughout, you know, a, a tumultuous year socially and politically and all of those things. Um, and I just got to the point where I was just like, this is not, we are not in community building mode at this business right now. We are not taking consensus. We are surviving and thriving as a goal. And we would send out, you know, every two months, we'd say, this is what we did. This is how we did it. This is how many cases we had. We had 10 cases over the course of the year um, and no community spread. I'm very proud of that. But we slipped along the way with some of that communication. You know, it's like we didn't always communicate perfectly to all the employees that, hey, we are doing, we are doing the tracing, you know, and no, I can't show it to you because I also need to be HIPAA compliant. You know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I can't just tell you who it is. So the person yeah. you're guessing it was that you work next to is actually not the person who's sick. So I, it was a very difficult tightrope to walk. And I'm sure that even in our own company, people think that we didn't do a good job or I didn't do a good job, but it was very, you know, it was very difficult to know what the right thing to do morally, ethically, all of that was. Um, and at the end of the day, the one thing I didn't want to do was nothing. Like, you know, that like more than anything else, I was like, well, we're going to keep trying and we may, we will make mistakes along the way. And, you know, we will not put people at undue risk to make those mistakes. That's the only rule. The two other things that came out of that, that I thought were really fascinating at the time as well is that, you know, we talked earlier about trading and you're buying those teenies um, as protection or to have cash on the books when, when cash is scarce is you had an interesting opportunity because you had, you know, um, you had savings and everything and you were running your business and you transitioned your business that now when you wanted to add wine, you were the only wine buyer in the market. And yeah. so then you were able to get unbelievable prices in bulk on wine at the time. Yeah, and even the short ribs. I mean, we bought like thousands of pounds of short ribs. Like we were the only people buying meat for like six weeks. So we, we had um, some purveyors that simply gave us duck and chicken. Because we ordered like, you know, whatever, a thousand pounds of chicken mm. and they delivered 3000 and just said, you know, donate it to hospitals or something, but it's going to go bad because no one else is ordering anything. Like for a while, early on in the pandemic, we were like the only place in Chicago ordering at scale. And so, yeah, I mean, I was going like when the, when the wine distributors and this lasted only people got wise to this pretty quickly, yeah. <laughs> like, like, you know, like when the wine distributors were kind of panicked early on, I was like. I'll buy all of it. Like, what's the allocation of, of, of X, Y, Z? I don't want to say what X, Y, Z was, but like yeah. the yeah. stuff that usually they give two bottles to a restaurant, I bought all of it for the whole Midwest. And I was like, that's like, that's like buying gold. Like no one's going to like, that's not going away. That's unbelievable. And the other thing that you brought up at the time that was kind of driving me nuts because I think there's a lot of, um, unfortunately in the restaurant industry, there's not maybe a lot of financial or accounting savvy, but out of the, out of the goodness of people's hearts, they wanted to help restaurants, but everybody was buying gift certificates. And I'm like, that's a liability on your balance sheet. And, and even so the restaurants don't understand it, you know, and um, the GoFundMes, I mean, there is a restaurant in Chicago who I love. It's run by a husband and wife. I love them. And they called me early in the pandemic and they put up a GoFundMe. And I was like, it's out of scale. You're going to raise $10,000. That's like a day, like three days of payroll. Like that's not going to help, but it's going to make people feel like they're helping. It's going to make your staff feel like they're helping. And then they're going to get $50 each. Like that's not, you're, 
you're actually being counterproductive. And she was kind of crying on the phone to me. And she's like, why are you being so mean to me? Like, you know, and I'm like, I'm not being mean. I'm telling you that it's worthless. And she was like, that's mean. And I said, no, 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 it's, it's, I'm helping, you know, like, this is what you need to do. And a lot of people just were overwhelmed. I mean, rightfully so it's, it was scary as hell. Like, but like, you know, they, they figured it out eventually. Like the thing was, is that like, um, one of the things that like kind of irks me about some of the companies that claim that they were helping and stuff during this time is like, it took them nine months to get their to go product going or whatever. Like, okay, thanks. Like we now need to work on the transition going back. Yeah. You know, and that's like, like, that segues me perfectly is like, not only were you having during this unprecedented time, um, you know, dealing with all the stress at the Alinea group restaurants, but then you, you know, you had this Herculean turn with talk, which is your reservation and CRM system that came out of those original tickets for next. So tell me about how you guys were able, I mean, I, the rapid transition still blows my mind, even thinking back to it now. Well, so I, I had talked to a couple of our engineers and whatnot and said, reservations are going to nothing. Now we make our money on SAS fees, monthly fees um, that are flat. And then we we make money on payment processing because we we take the credit cards instead of the POS system, you know? And um, when that was going to zero, uh, tax revenue goes to zero, right? And so and we weren't gonna be able to charge restaurants a SAS fee while they're closed and, and getting obliterated. So we froze hiring, we probably, we, planned on hiring 50 or 60 people um, in 2020 in our budget. And we were growing a couple hundred percent a year. And then in February, I could see things starting to tail off. And I was like, this is going to zero. Like we have to freeze hiring. I, I had a call and said like, all the executives should go to zero pay, like including myself, like all those sorts of things. Like I was going to like cost mitigation and thinking, everyone was thinking this is going to last weeks. And I was like, this is going to last 18 to 24 months. How? 1919. Same thing. Like, you know, if we get lucky, it's a year. So I was like, we were right in the middle of a fundraise to blow it up big and faster and hire all these people. And a couple of the, the venture firms called me and said, yeah, you know, we're going to wait and see how this is on the other side. And I was like, okay, now we know what your metal's like. Um, and a couple of our engineers called and one of them emailed me and said, you know, we could reconfigure things to be like, you know, to go or at the time that he was saying carry out. And I was like, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really like the third party delivery apps. And, and like, I don't think that's going to be it. I have an email, which he waves around at my face all the time where I said like, yeah, I don't think that's going to be it. And then like, I woke up the next day and I was then going like, Oh, we're going to have to do that for Alinea. And then I was like, oh, we should do that for talk. So I immediately got back to him and a couple other people. And Jeff Kaplan, our COO, had the exact same revelation. And he said, you know what we should do? We should screw all the normal processes. We should gather up five or 10 of the best engineers and designers. And we should just bang this out in three days, just like you did it like years earlier. And, you know, at this point we had, I don't know, 80 employees and we had processes and, and, you know, you can't really make, we were processing, we processed $400 million in 2019. So you can't just wing it anymore. It's like a real business. And, but we're like, we're going back to winging it mode. And we got Canlis in Seattle up and running three days later, Alinea was running day five. Um, and then what I realized is that all of the stuff we built was more valuable because you own the customer data. So you have the CRM. So you can tell all the Alinea customers, hey, we're canceling all your reservations, but now we're doing these beef Wellingtons. And all of the same stuff we did for Next back in 2010 turned around again for talk to go We did the marketing page. I mean, I, I named it like people are like, what do we name it? Like, and we like had all these names and I was like, to go, just to go. Cause it, <laughs> we don't know if we're delivering. We don't know. It's just to go. And it, it has alliteration. We're done. And one of the designers is like, I don't like it. I'm like, I don't give a shit. Just make talk to go, like make the page. And we did it all in a couple of days. And what we really rapidly realized is that the way that we do the 15 minute time slots and the derivative and the prepayment and all that, we had the two-way text messaging meant that our system was immediately better than like Uber Eats and Grubhub and DoorDash and all those guys, like, cause they were just supplemental, but now they were everything. They weren't built to be everything. We were built to be everything. 
And so restaurants very, very, very quickly started coming back. And then we had our oh shit moment, which was we froze hiring six weeks ago and we are going to onboard 2000 restaurants in a month. We can't do that. So we got to our account management team that sort of does the build and train stuff. And we're like, I hate webinars. I like a one-on-one -on -one thing. And I'm like, we're starting to do webinars. <laughs> 40, 50 restaurants a day, like, you know, get everyone trained and up and going. And I think that that was like, we were one of the few hopeful companies. Like we said, like, hey, we got you. We're not going to charge a monthly fee. We're only going to charge two or 3% instead of 30 or 20, like the, like the big guys are doing. And um, we ended up hiring 80 people for the year, um, which is, I couldn't tell you what some of the, I, I see them on Zoom. I remember I bumped into um, one of our employees um, walking down the street, we had masks on and she recognized me. And I was like, oh, you, you're you complete, like, I, I, you look really tall on Zoom and you're short, you know, <laughs> but like, you don't know what people look like. Um, it's going to be fascinating when we finally get back to an office, but we ended up um, growing hundreds and hundreds of percent um, for the year. And now we built a whole bunch of tools to take those restaurants who were just doing to go on talk and go, okay, now here's how you do capacity restriction. So if you open up at 25%, you can dial that and you know all those deposits and prepayment that we used to talk about where people are scared of it they're now going like oh that makes sense for my five best tables and i'm gonna take a five dollar deposit to make sure the no-show rate goes down and all that so all the things i was saying for all those years just got accelerated um during covid and you know it remains to be seen how much of it sticks around uh, in the short term but in the long term i'm very confident that it will it will grow quickly i have not a, a Two or three weeks from now, there's a big announcement about talk, which I can't unfortunately tell you. Um, it's such a tease, such a tease. Big, it is big enough that I can't tell you. Um, and normally I'm very transparent, but this one I'm truly muzzled on. But talk, talk will be global. That's it's it's you know we're in 28 countries now, but we'll be truly go global soon. Yeah, I think about it as like the the as I was joking earlier, ten talk was one of those 10 year overnight uh, successes, right? And it's like basically. You know, it's an ultimate I told you so for you because you've been ripping your hair out, you know, yelling at people, this is how we need to do things, everything. And then we had this, you know, horrible event with COVID, but it brought forward all the things that you've been working on that you were saying should happen. And it forced people to change. And sometimes we need to force to change because, yeah, you know, I, we get caught up in our ways a lot. I, I, I literally had, there's a, a top restaurant in America where I had a, 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 an an email exchange with them yesterday. And they're like, oh yeah, we're just gonna go back to the way we used to do things. We're gonna go back onto open table. We're afraid to take a deposit. This seems like this, they offered us five years of no charges for free. And my email was called free is expensive. Yeah. Like if someone's offering you something for free, it's probably not valuable. <laughs> like that's just the way it is, right? You're the product. You're the product. And so, um, there will be people who are reactionary and want to go to the before times. Like, I think we all have that itch to go like, let's just go back to 2019. Everything was, it was a fun year, you know? And I'm kind of going like, no, 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 don't be reactionary. Be, be anti-fragile, like get stronger as things break, you know? And I'm really, really proud of our team um, at both the Alini group and talk like, you know, it's, it's great. Like you get to interview me and I, I get to say all these things or whatever, but like, if we didn't have hundreds of people that, that were willing to work their tails off and build the stuff and go along for the ride. Um, I mean, we worked our tails off in the last year. Yeah. Um, so it's, I, I really thank all of them. It's absolutely incredible story. And I, I think about like, What's amazing to me about also your entrepreneurial journey is like you went from options market making where you're making hundreds of bets a day. So you get the law of large numbers and it's just probabilities. Then you go to like restaurants and, uh, and, and other new businesses where you only may make one decision or uh, out, of, out of five, maybe total decisions in your sure. lifetime. It takes three to five years to play out. It's decision making under opacity. It's so different from market making. And then I think about you know, talk, now you're in a business that you're not profitable on day one. You have a lot of burn rate when you're building an app. Yeah. It's, you've mastered like three different businesses and that's just incredibly fascinating that it's three different, distinctly different domains. Yeah, I, I've been going through a process right now where we have to go back through all of this journey of building talk and everything. And, and it's even that's been educational because, you know, you accrue so much knowledge and you know, just, you know, how everything's done. 
And in the process of going back through that all and gathering it and organizing it and all that, I was like, wow, we've, we've learned a lot in the last six years. And that institutional knowledge that we've gotten, and not just myself, but you know, a lot of the key people, um, has been almost revelatory for me because I, you know, you, you, you build it and grind every day. And at the end you go, Oh my God, look at all this stuff. So it's been a fascinating process. And, and, you know, it's, it's one of those things I have a 22 year old son and I kind of like, you know, at 22 years old, you don't want to listen to the, to the old guy. And I, I, I certainly get that, but there's like, I wish I could hit the download button of like all this experience knowledge. Cause they are three different kinds of businesses completely. And um, they have a lot that they can learn from each other. Exactly. And I look forward to having you back on in a year or two to just see what, what's annoying you now and what, what new industry <laughs> are you trying to revolutionize. So I, I really appreciate your time. This has been thoroughly enjoyable. Thank you, Jason. Um, great to be with you and, and um, great questions. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, Visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.